But blessed is he who keeps the law. I'll make this simple and what this is saying. Listen, when we don't allow God to give us a vision, a prophetic vision, we don't allow God to show us the way, we cast off restraint. There's no limits to what we might do. All right? And I'll tell you some other translations in a minute. But blessed is he who keeps the law. For us, that is, hey, blessed is he who lives their life according to God's law. God's vision. So we got to have this vision of what God wants to do. Without it, some translations read this. There's a ton of translations that are pretty good. Some say this, where there is no vision, look, if we cast off restraint, then where are we going? Our own way. If we're going our own way, we're going away from God. We're going towards death, towards chaos. A lot of translations will read this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people fall into chaos. So we're going to be looking at this today and getting a vision for what God wants to do in our lives and, and, and learn how we can be blessed by keeping this, but, but looking at this, and I got a lot of reference verses today, so you're going to love to, if you're writing notes down today, you're really going to like this. There's going to be a lot of scripture there. The, the notes aren't very long, but there's a lot of scripture here today, and today is, is about the fact that, that we, if we don't set our sights on God and His will, then we can expect to perish or for our lives to be led into chaos. We lose self-control and, and lose sight of God's plan. And so this happens from us from time to time. We, we do this. We lose our vision for what God wants to do. Everyone in here, this guy included, we all lose sight of what God wants to do in our life. And there's, there's a lot of different causes that come along that cause us to lose sight of what God wants to do. And, and we've, we've talked about these a lot in here, and you'll see, that, you'll see it in our text quite a bit. But I've, I've tried to sum it up within a couple of things here. But what causes us to lose the vision of what God wants to do is this, is we get distracted and or we give in to temptation. There's differences there. Y'all understand this, like, your day-to-day and the things that go on in your life, the, the, the distractions and, and the temptations, the distractions and the temptations, y'all, those aren't sins. You get that, right? The distractions and the temptations aren't sins. They're there. They're going to be there. What happens is we allow those distractions to take our eyes off of Jesus and what he wants to do in our life. We allow them to overpower us and to become the most important thing, the distractions become the most important thing, not God. We'll see it in Scripture, too, in a little bit. The distractions do. And then oftentimes those distractions, they're trying to just straight pull us away from God, and we give in to that temptation. It happens for all of us. Very easy to get off track and to lose our vision for what God wants to do in our everyday life because our eyes are fixed on everything else. And we get worried, and we get stressed, and we get angry. And it's really easy. And it can be simple things. And I've got just a couple of things here. An argument with a spouse. <laughs> Did y'all, I heard something too. Did y'all hear that? Or, or listen, anybody in your family. Kids. Amen. Other family members, listen, oh God, listen, can I preach to you right now? A disruption of your daily routine. Some of y'all, I, I said this in the first service, let me say it again, okay? I, that right there, you want, it, you want this guy to like get his eyes off Jesus and what I got, like what, like my wife's in the back, rocking back and forth laughing right now. She's about to fall out of her chair. When my day gets disrupted, like y'all know, I'm, a little, I'm slightly, slightly, a little OCD. I like things. I like my lists. I like the things I need to get done. I, I'm, I like to be efficient. I like to have order. I like to have these things in my life. I have my step one, wake up. I've told you, I, that used, I used to make lists that bad. That used, to be the number, like, that used to be the number one thing on my to-do list, and I put it there so when I got out of bed, I could scratch something up. That have felt good. That is the straight truth. For 10 years, the number one thing on my to-do list every single day that was written down was wake up. So I went through that, and so I'd go through this list. Throw me off track. 
and see if it's not a huge distraction or a temptation or it, it pulls me away. And here's the thing. For some of y'all in here, y'all could care less about that. That won't, y'all don't care. Man, y'all, and I, listen, I envy some of y'all. See, I'm sinning right there. I'm sinning right there. No, I look at that. I, I would like to have that quality to some degree that you have. It would drive me crazy if you just totally didn't care. But, like, I would like to be able to loosen that up a little bit as a distraction in my life and maybe have a, a little more relaxed attitude because some of y'all can just flow with it, man. You roll and you're good, right? But then there's something you got. That don't bother me. I don't know. You, you've, got, you've got a distraction and a temptation. There's something about that, that you struggle with that I don't. So that, that desire for me to have my daily routine in place, big deal to me, maybe not so big to you. All right? Your, your issues with your coworkers may be like a huge thing on your list. You know what? I, my, I love my coworkers, man. It's awesome. We're like, we're family. It's awesome. It's great. So, like, we all have these different distractions, temptations, things, weaknesses in our flesh, all sorts. And I know what our, t listen, it, we're human beings, so what we tend to do is we tend to go, yeah, but you don't know what mine is. You don't know how bad it is to be me. You don't know how bad it is to have this weakness or this temptation. There's all sorts of, and listen, the enemy, he'll come at you with a number of things, but I want to like take away a little, just a little bit today. Listen, you know that we've got to sharpen you up, right? Like we, we're here to encourage you, but we also got to get you in line from time to time. And we got to kind of, you know, shake a little sense into you every once in a while. We can't allow the pity party to go on all the time, all right? So if you're here today and you're like, yeah, but my distractions and my temptations, and it's just so hard, and I'm so weak, and this and that, well, boo-hoo, let me tell you, the, the temptations in your life are no different from what other people experience. I didn't say it, God did, so get mad at him. They're no different. We all struggle with getting distracted. We all struggle with those temptations that pull us from God. Whatever they are in your life, maybe the same as mine, maybe different than mine, whatever it is. But look at the very next thing. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he'll show you a way out so that you can endure. Every single one of you, when that something happens that distracts your day or disrupts your day, you, after that, you, how he responds on you. It's your choice. We have to grow up and be responsible for the things that we do and, the, and our actions and how we handle these distractions and these temptations. When things don't go my way with my daily routine, uh, there's a couple of things I can do. And I've, listen, I've done them both, and I can tell you which one works out a lot better. I've allowed something so minuscule to totally throw me off the whole day and ruin it all. Or I've been able to go, it's okay. Roll off my back a little bit. God, just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow myself to get upset. And y'all know, y'all know what it is. Y'all, y'all have those moments, whether it's a decision you're making about it. You know, should I, should I do this or should I do that? You got the, you got the angel and the devil. You got all these different things. You know the right thing or the wrong thing. And if you're going to allow your anger and your own flesh to handle the situation, you're going to go that route where you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. And I think about this, and here's the thing. Sometimes we get so distracted. I talked about the things, the distractions in our life, the things that we have to deal with, the temptations. It causes us to worry, causes us to get upset. Do y'all ever get, listen, do y'all get wrapped up? Please, I know I'm not preaching to myself. There's got to be somebody else. Do y'all get so wrapped up in details sometimes that stress you out and the details never even matter really? Like, I mean, like, do like those kind of things happen for y'all too? All the time. All right, listen. There's somebody you need to read about in Scripture. because there's. It, it, let's, look at this. Look at this right here. This is in the Gospel of Luke. This is Jesus during his ministry. A couple of sisters, Martha and Mary. Look, look at what the Bible says. Martha was distracted. Jesus was coming to the house. God up in the house. God was in the house. But she is distracted on trying to make everything look good. <laughs> it wasn't just about the eating, though. Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away.
from her. That one thing was just God's presence. That's the most important thing. The most important. God's presence. He's right there, and she's still stressed out. God's right there. She's still just as stressed as she can be. And I get it. It's very human. Understandable, even. I mean, hey, if Jesus was coming to your house, wouldn't you want things to be perfect? I get it. I'm not condemning her for feeling that way or for doing that. But we, that's when we have to step aside from what we think and how we feel and understand that what God sees and what he wants is a lot different than the things that we feel are so important. Just that presence. And, and, and the distractions sometimes and the temptations and what happens in our life, we get distracted by things present, things past, things future. We get distracted by what somebody's done to us, what somebody said to us. We get distracted by some pain that we've went through, some suffering that we're going through, some heartache that we're experiencing, a loss in our lives, somebody betraying us. You ever having a great day sometimes and it's for some reason you think about something that just makes you mad? And I think about these things and, 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 and then it makes me think of Jesus on his way to Calvary and the pain and the suffering and the betrayal and the heartache that he had experienced and how he still was willing to do what God had called him to do. And we'll look at him in just a little bit. But we get this way. Listen. We get distracted and we give in to temptation. I think I've spoken to somebody today when it comes to that. I, I believe that. That's who we are in our flesh. And then oftentimes we lose sight of what God wants to do in our life because, and we've talked about this before, we get complacent. We just, we kind of get complacent. We, we lose our vision of what God wants to do in our life because, Every day just kind of bleeds into the next day, and it's the same. We're not looking for things. We're not really, we're not aware of God's presence in our life. We get, we get complacent in our spiritual walk. We forget to do the things that got us where we're at. I mean, look, I, I, I know I can't be the only one that feels like there are times in my life when I feel so close to God, and I know that I feel His presence in my life. I've saw, He's not gone anywhere, but I've sought Him through through prayer and through, 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 through reading his word and through just, just, just thinking about it, being, being aware of that, having a prayerful mind all the time. And I, and I know that that's when my soul is most joyful and at peace and at ease. And then for whatever reason, some, something along the way, somewhere along the way, I'll just kind of get complacent. And I'll start to fade away. And, and, and here's, the, here's why. And listen, this again, this speaks to all of us. We're all creatures of habit, and we like comfort. We like comfort. We don't like change. Some of us deal with it better than others, but nobody really loves for things to just get thrown up and changed up on them. We get, we get comfortable in any sense of the word. We get stale oftentimes. I shared this illustration a few weeks ago, y'all, and I'm telling you, like sometimes when you preach so much and you, do, you have an opportunity to share God's word, you forget about when it was. I don't know if it was on a Wednesday or Sunday, but I remember I gave this illustration a while back talking about how we get stale and how we start to lack a vision of what God wants to do. About 350 years ago, a, a shipload of travelers landed on the northeast coast of America, the very first European uh, colonists who would come here. The first year... They established a town site, so they, 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 they sell, think of this now, they're willing, they're willing to leave their homeland and travel 3,000 miles across an ocean, hoping to find something. They had that vision, and this, listen, they were, they were ready to go. So they get, they get here, they establish a town site in the first year, and in the second year, they elect a government. Year three, the government made some plans. We're going to build a road five miles westward into the unknown. <coughs> and in year four, the people tried to impeach the government because they thought it was a waste of time and money to go five miles outside of where they were. They had, listen, how are people who had the vision to see 3,000 miles across the ocean and overcome all the hardships and 
and, and unknowns and, 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 and suffering to get there in just a few years weren't even able to see five miles outside of town. They lost their pioneering vision. They lost the vision that they had. And oftentimes we get to places in our life where we get so comfortable. And listen, it happens whether we're old, young, in between. Oftentimes we get to places in our life where we're just comfortable. Like, well, I guess God's just done. It's all good. I hope it just is just, just good like it is. And we don't want to move and we don't want to do anything. And our biggest prayer is, you know, God, don't, don't rock my world. Don't, don't make me any, don't, any changes. Don't want nothing to come my way. And, and we, we lose this passion for living because we get too set in, in, in our comfort. And spiritually, we do that as well. I mean, we just do. Jesus says this when it comes to complacency. You're, you're neither hot nor cold. He's talking about, uh, he's using us as, uh, as water. And he says, I wish you were one or the other, but since you're like lukewarm water, which is just stale and stagnant, just sits there, I'll spit you out. That's not good. This, isn't so, this is not a compliment from Jesus. This is him saying, I love, I love it when you just sit around and do nothing. I, I wish you were one or the other, hot or cold. So how do we, how do we keep from becoming complacent? We, in, in, in losing our vision, what we've got to do is we've got to acquire a vision for what God wants to do, and we've got to understand that God does have things he wants to do. How do we, how do we know what God wants to do in our lives? And I asked these kids up here, and you know the answer because they knew the answer, and it was the first thing that was set up here. First thing that we can do is spend time in prayer. Speaking to the God of the universe, seeking his will for our life. Oswald Chambers, Christian author, wrote that we have to pray with our eyes on God, not on the difficulties. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn because we hurt and, and we suffer and we want some healing in our lives. I understand it and we want things in our life. But how often are our prayers me-centered? Just me-centered. God, I, God, just do this in my life. God, just do this in my life. Take this away. Take this away. Why? Hey, listen, instead, oftentimes, I'm encouraging you because I've prayed this way as well. God, take this away. Take this away. If only this, if only that. No, God, it is what it is. Lord, you've brought this, like, this is, this is what's going on in my life. How can you use me in this circumstance? How can you use me in this situation? How can I still do your will no matter what's going on around me? Man, it's crazy and it's chaotic and this hurts and I don't like it. But I still want to do your will through this, God. I still want to see what you're doing in this. Like, God, you're, you're here in this and it's hard for me in my flesh to see what you're doing, but I know there's something here. Show me. And... I think of this the, about praying with our eyes on God and not on the difficulties. We, we don't tell you to do these things and we don't encourage you to do these things unless we see the one, the only one that matters in Scripture. We see him doing this and as he gives us this example of this, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is right before he's arrested and going to the cross. And, I mean, he knows all that's coming. He's already went through, he knows what's coming. He knows he's about to be arrested, beaten, whipped, and, and, and hung on the cross. And he says, Father, if you're willing, please take this suffering away. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. What was God's will? For Jesus to go to the cross. Pay the price for our sins so that we might have freedom. So we have to spend time in prayer to know what God's vision is for our life. Not what we see, not what we want, but God's vision. And another thing that I talk to with the kids, and I know it, an, an, an easy one be, would be to spend time in God's Word. All right, we, we understand that. Yes, spend time in God's Word. But let me tell you something that's going to help you see what God wants to do in your life. It's not just prayer, but also time. I know God can do miracles, and I know things happen overnight. Sometimes things happen in our lives very quickly, but I'm telling you that oftentimes, listen, God is always faithful. He desires our faithfulness, 
And it's going to take some time to see what he wants to do through our faithfulness. And, and, and we're going to go through things in life. Listen, God's timing is different than ours. We've, we've seen this. There's a time for us. I, 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 want to, I want to be real with you. And I, want to say, like, I want you to think of every human emotion you can go through. And, 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 and more than that, like maybe, maybe every possible circumstance or situation that you can imagine under the sun, good, bad, and otherwise. If you're blessed enough to live long enough, you're going you're to go through it. You're going to go through it. You can't avoid it. You won't avoid it. It's going to happen. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, for everything there is a season. Everything. A time for every activity under heaven. You're going to experience these things in life. It's in God's timing. We're not guaranteed if there's short, long seasons, what, this, that. Well, well what do you mean? A, 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 a time for what? For everything, there's a, a time for every activity. Okay, so let's tell you what they are. You ready? There's a time to be born, die, plant, harvest, kill, heal, tear down, build up, cry, laugh, grieve, dance, scatter stones, gather stones, embrace, turn away, search, quit searching, keep Throw away, tear, mend, be quiet, speak, love, hate, war, and peace. There's a time for all of that in life. You're going to go through it all. So get ready, because it's coming. That pretty much covers the human experience. It's there. The good and the bad. And if we want to see what God wants to do in our life, we, we, we've got to remember his timing is different. Listen to this. We, we've heard this before, too. A thousand years in your sight as but as yesterday. So how many of y'all have heard that before? I, I didn't realize this. I, I kind of read this. And I've seen the scripture. I knew where to pull it up. But, that, but, but something else spoke to me too. David's making an even bigger point than just that whole idea of like a thousand years is but a day. Like we've all heard that, right? A thousand years is like one day to God. Well, he even makes it shorter at the second part of that verse. It ain't even like, a day. like it could be like just a watch in the night. Just a few hours. God's timing is totally different, totally different. So in order to know what he wants to do, we've got to allow for that time in our lives and, and to know, listen, it's going to take time. And so once we understand that it takes prayer, it takes time to see what God wants to do in our life. We, we have to be faithful because he's always faithful. But once we get there, I think we all want this. And maybe this is a place where we can go back to if we ever do lose this vision in our life. We can go back and say, well, look, I need to get it, and I want to maintain this vision. I want to see what God wants to do. I don't want to lose sight of what God is trying to do in my life. So how can I maintain this? I want to continue to grow. I want to go where he calls me to go. I want to do what he calls me to do. I want to keep moving in this relationship. I want to keep growing in this relationship. If that's true, then here's what we have to do. All right? If we want to grow, we want to maintain this vision, We'll finish this up here with a couple of points. You have to have faith in new and great things. And this is a struggle with a lot. Of, I understand. We get a little, like, listen, I, we're, we're get, we, we get older, we start to live more and more. It's a, the older we get, the greater the challenge is to not live in the past. Do y'all, come on, some of you a little older, like around me, y'all know that, right? Like, we, we want to do that, right? We like to look back at the better thing. All the best, the best things are behind us. All the best things are behind us. Right? Do you, do you believe, you have to ask, like, you have to answer this question today. This is, you have to search up. Do you believe that God has great things in store for you or are you living on what was? And you just kind of checked out and done. I heard and I read a little story. This is good. Because it like, whichever one you do, listen to this story, okay? It's illustration describing our attitude of faith. Both the hummingbird and the vulture fly over the exact same lands of this country. All the vultures see is rotting meat because that's what they're looking for. They thrive on that diet. But hummingbirds ignore the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, they look for the colorful blossoms 
of desert plants. The vultures live on what was. They live on the past. They fill themselves with what is dead and gone. But hummingbirds live on what is. They seek new life. They fill themselves with freshness and life. And just as each bird finds what it is looking for, so do we. So what are you looking for? Are you a vulture or are you a hummingbird? Do you seek what is fresh and new and have faith that God will provide for you? Or do you live on the past? We want to believe that God has great and new things in store. Whether we are 5, 50, or 100, God's not done. There are still things he wants to do in your life. We've got to continue to seek God's will fresh and new each day, to stay with Jesus, to abide in him. And, and when we have those opportunities, when we have faith in new and great things and those things come before us or God gives us a vision of these great things, we have got to have the courage to act on faith. Not just, hey, God's really laying on my heart to grow in this relationship, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, again, there are a lot of things that we can do that, 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 will, that will be supplemental to this vision God wants to do in your life. This is one of those things. But this don't make you good, and this ain't going to do anything for you just being here and listening to this unless we put it into action in our lives, unless we act on what we see. Because all of the goodness and all of the things we try to do to gain favor, just checking our little list off of our activities and the things we do, it'll never please God and you'll never be at peace. It's by faith. The Bible tells us this in Hebrews 11. Six, hey, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You gotta, if you want to draw near to God, you must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Have this faith in Him. So what does God want to accomplish in and through you? to help build his kingdom, to share the gospel? And do you have enough faith to influence? And listen, hear, hear my heart when I say this about influence. Because the answer to this for all of us is yes. Because we get wrapped up in like, oh my gosh, i got to go preach to one person a day and share the gospel and give the plan of salvation to one person a day. I can't do that. I'm not a pastor. I'm not talking about I, influence. I'm talking, can you influence? Can you, what, what God has shown you in your, in your faith do you have enough faith to influence one person per day by some, through something that you do, by God showing you something in your life? And listen, yes, it can be a, a, a small act of kindness. I mean, I'm not, again, uh, it doesn't have to be evangelizing or it doesn't have to be 5, 10, 15 people a day. Just one person a day to share the goodness of God. That's it. Like, don't, don't, get, don't get too wrapped up. One person a day to share the goodness of God with. One person. Over 10 years, that's 3,650 people. Over 25 years, that's 9,125 people. If you're blessed enough to live long enough to impact uh, someone, uh, one person per day over 75 years, that's 27,375 people. God wants to use us. And I remember at the very beginning of this service, when we first started off, I, I said this. I said, all right, I want you to think about it now. What's about what God's will is? What do you think God's will is? I think his vision for your life is, right? And I asked you to think about that, right? And, 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 you know, like, and, and when you thought about it, there was something that came up in your life, something that you either need to be doing for God or something you don't need to be doing because it's dishonoring God. A sin in your life, maybe a sin of commission, something you're doing, or a sin of omission, something you're leaving out when it comes to God. God gave you a picture of that. Like you thought of that, all right? And then you thought of, man, if I do that, what might God want to do in my life? The good things. Think about, you thought about the good things God wants to do in your life when you thought about that thing. But listen to this. We, we, we bring it all full circle in Scripture, because I, I love this. This is one of my more, most encouraging passages of Scripture. When I think I've got it figured out and how God's going to use me, I remember what His Word says, that God is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might think. Infinitely more. By nature, we belittle our own abilities, and we belittle what God might want to do in us and through us. He'll do infinitely more if you'll trust in Him. But you've got to have that trust and allow God 
to show you what to do and have that vision for what God wants to do. And, and, and I'll tell you this, I said, it, I said it last week, I said it Wednesday night, if, if we want to live this kind of life where, where we can have a vision for what God wants to do, I, I promise you this, like this is just, this ain't me being all whatever, I, I'm trying to be truthful with you. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb in this world. You're going to be different. Because most people aren't going to do that. They, they, most people, from the time they wake up in the morning until the time they close their eyes at night to quit seeing the world around them, as soon as they open their eyes in the morning, all they see and all they do a lot is just, it's totally, it's all around themselves. It's all about themselves. It's a vision for what they want to do in their own lives, not a vision for what God wants to do through them. You're going to be different if you seek God's will, how he wants to use you in your relationships, at work, raising your kids, how you do the things you do. And so I pray that, that you'll have the courage to be different and that you'll have the courage to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to live my life for God and trust in him. I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to spend time in his word, and I'm going to trust in his timing when it comes to this area of my life. So we'll pray, and we'll give you an opportunity to respond. Let's pray together. Jesus.